In May 1974, Statistics Canada reported that women in Ontario alone lost $3 billion annually in potential wage and salary income due to male-female wage inequalities. The figure for all of Canada was a whopping $7 billion. Although there had been commitment to redress this situation in Canada, at least since the 1951 International Labour Office Convention, and in follow-up legislation at the federal and provincial levels, unequal pay still prevailed into the 1980s and, of course, still exists today. Organisations such as the Equal Pay Coalition of Ontario led the way in fighting to obtain legislative change that would enforce not just equal pay for equal work, but proactive equal pay for work of equal value. Mary Cornish and Laurel Ritchie, two of the founders of the Equal Pay Coalition of Ontario, spoke to Rise Up about the stages of this struggle and the importance of winning the passage of the in innovative Bill 154, the Pay Equity Act of Ontario in June 1987. Welcome, Mary and Laurel. On behalf of Rise Up Feminist Digital Archive, um, I, we're, I've invited you today to come and talk to us about the history of equal pay for equal value in Ontario and how we ended up with the Pay Equity Act. And um, perhaps you'd like to briefly introduce yourselves um, first. Okay. I'm Mary Cornish. I'm a uh, pay equity and uh, human rights lawyer, labor lawyer, and um, I helped to co-found the Equal Pay Coalition in Ontario with Laurel Ritchie and um, was involved in doing legal cases around pay equity. Thank you. Laurel. Right. Hi, uh, so I am currently working as a volunteer with the Good Jobs for All Coalition. Uh, a retired uh, union representative and uh, also a co-founder of the Equal uh, Pay Coalition with Ray Cornish. Thank you. So um, I know that we go back a long way with Equal Pay. Um, you know, that the things started as probably as early as 1917, if not before. But, um, and then we, we move into 1951 with the uh, United Nations Convention. But I wonder if you could perhaps give us some background, perhaps you'd like to start with this, Laurel, as to what, was, what, were, the, um, what were the beginnings of the movement in Canada and what did it look like? Well, uh, we, as always, are speaking from personal uh, experience, um, but uh, the, there was an uh, international labor organization uh, convention 100 in the year 1951, where the concept of equal pay for work of equal value was first raised in an international uh, uh, forum that was um, voted upon and agreed upon. Uh, and uh, many people did not understand at the time that there was any difference between that and equal pay for equal work. Uh, but it was reaffirmed uh, later at the United Nations in the 1960s. And then uh, I think we would have to say the sort of formal uh, way that this came forward in Canada was with the Royal Commission on the Status of Women which called on the, the government to uh, ratify uh, ILO uh, Convention 100, including equal remuneration. Uh, and, and that uh, concept of equal pay for, uh, sorry, equal remuneration for work of equal value was quite critical um, to the variety of uh, issues we took up. I think probably the next important event and really in the same year as the release of the Royal Commission on Status of Women was the Strategies for Change Conference uh, in Toronto, which brought together women uh, from across Canada, uh, where this was an issue. And um, then we had the formation of the National Action Committee on the Status of Women and uh, also the Ontario Committee on the Status of Women. Um, the National Action Committee took up the issue more or less at the federal level 
and the Ontario Committee on the Status of Women pursued the issue uh, of equal pay for work of equal value provincially. Um, there was also, um, as things happen, uh, there was also a strike that year, the, the Dare Cookie strike in South uh, Western Ontario, uh, mostly women on the picket line. Uh, and uh, a key issue there was that the employer wanted to give a larger uh, pay increase to the women, uh, sorry, to the men, mm -hmm. and uh, a smaller pay <laughs> increase to the women. <laughs> that should be a no-brainer. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the women's movement and the union movement, uh, it was a small union actually, uh, not one that I had been familiar with, uh, was uh, in the background, but uh, uh, a wide variety of people came together um, to take on uh, the issues there. And uh, it, in, in its time, it was a quite famous strike uh, for women uh, in the labor movement. So Mary, how exactly did the um, coalition get founded? Was this, was that, did it get founded in the period that Laurel is talking about or was it a bit later? It was founded in 1974 and it came out of the actions that were flowing from what Laurel has described from the, particularly from the um, Commission on the Status of Women and, and um, the movements to try and then um, in 1972, the government actually ratified the ILO Convention. And people started working at that period of time to start trying to figure out how to operationalize that through laws across the country. And um, we were also, uh, in Ontario, there was a movement, um, uh, particularly which Madame Perrant and, and Laurel were working on with respect to amending the, uh, the around efforts that were being made to amend the Employment Standards Act, which had the very limited equal pay definition in it. So all of that kind of came together and actually, we, Laurel and I joke about this, but you know, we actually co-founded it in um, my sauna at um, 77 Gerard Street West at the top of the building, uh, which was really when we got together and said, you know, we really need to have a coalition of groups and I think it was very important at this period of time to understand that the union movement and community groups did not often come together in coalitions to try and move forward a social justice issue. They tended to be in different silos. Um, and so we were trying to bring them together into one group and also to bring it together in a um, nonpartisan way in the sense that we were prepared to um, work with political parties that would, um, you know, would subscribe to the position we were taking. Um, so we founded the coalition and it had a broad based group of unions. It had community groups, the YWCA, the business and professional women's unions, uh, clubs, uh, which had been very active as well themselves in, in trying to bring forward um, equal pay for work of equal value. And the other, um, I think, main part of it was also um, focusing on this uh, notion of it being an international human right, a labor right, but also a human right that world governments had agreed to. And that was why we needed to move forward with it, that women in Ontario needed to have that right. Um, Laurel, what happened as a result of the dare cookie strike? In the end, there were equal uh, uh, payments made to the men and to the women. Um, we actually, many of us were arguing at the time for adjustments <laughs> for women's uh, 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 classifications, which were often uh, underpaid. But a big problem at the time, and, and it's one where we had to contend with some of uh, our own unions, uh, was a tendency on the part of both labor uh, and uh, business to give percentage increases, which over time always increased the gap that existed between men and women's pay. So uh, that was uh, one of those one of those pieces. I think we don't pay a lot of attention to right now, but uh, at that time. Um, we thought of remuneration, in fact, very broadly. Uh, and so uh, it was a question of um, trying to close the gap 
uh, as well as to make sure that it wasn't through percentage uh, uh, or disproportionate increases to men increasing and uh, benefits uh, uh, equally was also on our agenda, equal benefits. So maybe this is a good point for you to explain, one of you, the differences in terminology, um, assuming that you know, there'll be audiences that have never been in this debate. So in Ontario, there was an Equal Pay for Equal Work Act that came in in the, in the uh, 1950s. And essentially it meant that if a man and a woman were doing the identical job, they had to be paid the same. And the difficulty with that, of course, was that the way the structure of the economy worked is that primarily men and women worked at different jobs and they were occupationally segregated women were nurses, men were doctors at that time, people were secretaries versus outside workers. So you basically um, infrequently had men and women in the same job, although of course it did happen. Um, and often in that sense, they still were paid unequally. But the issue of equal pay for work of equal value and the importance of it was that it was to aim at the systemic discrimination which actually created this occupational segregation of jobs and then undervalued the work of women in those jobs. And, and it meant comparing dissimilar jobs. And, um, and I think when Laura was talking earlier about when they passed this uh, back in 1951, I'm not sure everybody actually understood the significance of actually fully implementing such a systemic remedy, which is really what it was, a systemic remedy to get at these problems. And um, it meant that women who were in a workplace when the act was finally passed in Ontario, um, a secretary could compare herself to a dissimilar male job in her workplace. And as long as the skill, effort, responsibility, and working conditions were substantially the same and of equal value, then she should be paid the same amount as that male dominated job. Right, that's, that's much clearer, thank you. Um, so maybe you could continue with talking about how you think you, went, you moved from the initial legislation that was limiting to the um, Pay Equity Act in 1987. What, what were the tactics? Who were the allies? What kind of uh, actions did you take? Mm -hmm. Laurel, do you want to say anything on that one? Well, um, yeah, we can share this one. Um, the, uh, w one of the first uh, major uh, activities of the uh, Equal Pay Coalition was a uh, forum that was held in downtown Toronto at OISI and uh, brought together a wide variety uh, of people. Um, some who, who uh, would identify very clearly as feminists, although some uh, were from the business and professional women's clubs, uh, some were uh, uh, political uh, candidates for different parties, uh, and some were more radical feminists. Uh, and certainly uh, labor women were there uh, in large numbers. And out of that, uh, we produced a, a little booklet um, with people writing on various aspects of the fight. And uh, I, I think it was really a, a keystone to some of the work uh, that we did because mm -hmm. it, it did represent uh, this uh, uh, very broad approach to what we were trying to do to improve women's uh, pay, including minimum wage increases and so on that sometimes get left out of the mix. Um, uh, so, the, I mean, there, there was that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of educational and organizing uh, uh, session that we would uh, put on, but also we did a lot of work. We were, we were very conscious uh, at the time uh, there were, uh, I th it would be fair, I think, to say that we were thinking primarily of some of the newer immigrant uh, groups uh, in the community. Uh, it was probably less about racialized communities and it was more about uh, the large numbers of uh, women who come from Italy and Greece and Portugal and 
China and so on. And so we did a lot of sessions in the community, uh, pulling in people who did educational work and we had interpreters. Uh, we, we, uh, that were very conscious of trying to do uh, that outreach and to some extent materials in other languages. Um, English was obviously our mm -hmm. primary activity uh, language, but uh, we did do these other things. Um, we also had, um, we tried to have fun <laughs> as we went along. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, one of the events that uh, uh, I recall um, vividly was uh, when we were handing out uh, coupons uh, I can't remember what the differential was at the time, but certainly at one point it was Egg. like women were getting 60% of what men were getting. And uh, we had a, a, a lunchtime demonstration at the Ministry of Labor, uh, which is not a large space, uh, but we had hot dog stands set up and pop. And um, we had a petition, which we asked the uh, civil servants and ministry staff coming out to sign. And uh, I recall one of the things we proudly showed them was that Flora McDonald, who at the time was a federal uh, conservative member of parliament, had uh, signed uh, the petition. So uh, kind of representing that broad base. And um, I remember even some of the guys who had to pay the full dollar for the hot dog <laughs> uh, took it all uh, in good humor and, and, and uh, supported us in their various ways. So we did those sorts of things along the mm -hmm, way mm -hmm. to, uh, to have a, a, a bit of fun. And pamphleteering has kind of gone out of style, but you know, we did used to stand at subway and bus stops uh, in downtown Toronto mm -hmm. and hand mm -hmm. out uh, 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 pamphlets uh, explaining uh, what we were up to and trying to get this law changed. Right. Uh, Mary, do you want to go on from there? Uh, yeah, we, we had, um, the other thing we did was we, pretty regularly harassed the ministers of labor in Ontario. And I think I counted them up. I think we went through five of them between the time we started and the time we actually got that act. Uh, and they agreed in 85 to move forward with the act. And so we would keep meeting with them and we would bring to the meeting kind of senior people from all of the coalition organizations and kept being, uh, I'm sure they regarded us as a pest because we were constantly um, pursuing them to pursue um, equal pay for work of equal value for women in Ontario. So uh, I think we had the uh, campaign operating at a number of different levels, as Laura was describing, but also at the level of, of um, trying to bring forward legislation. So we actually also had the, the NDP brought forward a private member's bill in the early 80s. And because we had also um, uh, had a policy of, of uh, being nonpartisan, uh, both the, we had gotten both the Liberals and the NDP to um, support us. Uh, it was a Conservative government at the time. And actually that, that allowed us to get that private member's bill into committee where it then died. Um, but it was very important to have the um, two other parties supporting us because in the end, what happened was the, uh, the government, uh, the Tory government um, went into an election in 1985. Um, the Liberals won in a minority government. When they went to look at the issues that they could agree upon with the NDP in the accord that came out, um, equal pay for work of equal value was in both um, political agendas. And that's actually how we got the Pay Equity Act, because it then became part of the accord. And we moved forward from there. I actually, sorry, Sue, if I could. Um, I, I, I think that it, it, it's important also to... Um, recognize that we the whole concept of coalitions was still in mm -hmm. its time a fairly new one. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, one of the things we had to do battle with uh, 
in the labor movement, uh, in, including the labor movement, was um, that everything political didn't have to be partisan political. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, we had arguments when we had rallies and uh, uh, when we had forums about uh, whether we were going to let uh, politicians of whatever stripe uh, speak and we generally our policy was that uh, nobody could appear as a uh, as a politician from a particular party and um, I always think that one of the people who should uh, historically be given a lot of credit on this is uh, a, a former member of Parliament in Ontario MPP that is uh, Margaret Campbell um, mm -hmm. because she was one of the first, there were a series of bills, uh, various uh, private members' bills uh, calling for equal pay for work of equal value, and mostly they failed. Uh, and uh, uh, the first one, or one of the first ones was in 78, was Margaret Campbell's bill. Yeah, and it failed. Uh, but a year later, roughly a year later, when the NDP uh, uh, brought forward a private member's bill uh, through Ted Bounsell, um, uh, Margaret Campbell was able to set aside partisan politics in a way that is too rare. And um, she did uh, heaven knows what <laughs> behind the scenes, but made arrangements that when this bill, it was bill three at the time, uh, NDP private members bill was brought forward, uh, that certain uh, of her party, uh, liberal uh, MPPs would be um, absent for the vote if they were not comfortable voting in favor of it. And uh, what happened was that uh, when the bill was brought forward, between the diminished liberal numbers and the NDP that were out in full force, uh, the bill passed at second reading. Uh, to Ted Bounsell's great shock, uh, because he didn't understand how the women were organizing behind the scenes. <laughs> and um, I would say, uh, uh, you know, to our regret at the time, he chose to, uh, when he was, they were given a choice, do, you, do we go immediately to third reading uh, or do we send it to committee? And I think he was so confused and shocked. Uh, he said, send it to committee. And we were pulling our hair out <laughs> because we would have had the votes that day. Um, but there were then uh, many uh, bills afterwards before we got to the point uh, that Mary was making where we, we had an actual uh, pay, uh, equal pay uh, law in the province of Ontario. But um, it, I guess the point is that uh, the, there, there was a very, very wide and broad support for what we were doing and across partisan uh, political lines. And I think that that is at some point uh, what uh, really uh, assisted all the other organizations that were working on this to, uh, to uh, bring this to fruition. Thank you. So what were the, why was this particular Ontario Pay Equity Act so important, Mary? What, was, what were the pro, pros of it, of it that made it presumably palatable and even acceptable to the Equal Pay Coalition? <laughs> well, at its, at its um, basic, it, it recognizes in its preamble that there is systemic gender discrimination against women's work in Ontario, which was quite unusual for a bill, or a law to say this, right? And that's how it started. So it started from that assumption that there was this systemic gender discrimination and that was based on a lot of research that we put forward to show that, but it was right in the law at the top. And then the purpose of the rest of the act was essentially to have a step-by-step um, -step way to actually determine in any particular workplace, what were the dynamics of that discrimination and how would we remedy it through identifying male and female job classes, doing a job evaluation, and then, 
it required that if they were of comparable value, you must adjust the pay. So this was quite unusual law, and it was, and it still is the Ontario law is still considered um, in the international field to be quite a groundbreaking piece of legislation. The um, the other part to it that it was very important to us was that it. Um, gave the right of unions in, in unionized workplaces to in fact bargain the pay equity plan and that it also had an obligation on the part of employers to maintain the plan. So once you've done it, you then had to make sure that um, it continued to be maintained and the wage gap didn't um, reemerge. So those I think were some of the key aspects of it that made it important. And it was also proactive, wasn't it? Employers actually had to go out and um, yes, they had to go do initiate it. Initiate the pay equity plans. They, it wasn't something that they might have to do if it, if some employee went to the Human Rights Commission, but it was net, it was assumed that all employers would right. create plans. The proactive part made it different from the federal. Um, equal pay laws at that time, which were complaint based. You had to complain in order to get it to work. Um, what were the negatives? Well, there were negatives were, um, it was phased in over a fairly long period of time. So even though discrimination was identified, it wasn't rectified right away. Um, and, and when it was originally passed, um, there were about a million women who were left out of it because it provided for an evaluation method called job to job, which required you essentially to have um, in your workplace a male job that was actually the same points. And if they weren't the same points, then you, you weren't um, covered. And this meant that a lot of the predominantly female workplaces, which would be child cares, um, a lot of social service agencies, um, uh, nursing homes, all of these um, areas were left out of the first act. And so that meant that the coalition really from the time it was formed in 74 until this very day has continued to constantly be, have to go back to the government and make sure that we get better amendments. And so that's what happened in 93. We got more amendments that brought in uh, the rest of those women, at least provided them with a method um, and so uh, uh, it was really a constant struggle to keep trying to make sure it was having some effect. So was this the proxy method? Maybe, maybe yes. you should describe a little bit about what job evaluation okay. is and how it works, please. Okay. Well, the, the, um, the job to job method means that once you'd evaluated the jobs and you would use different factors of skill, effort, and responsibility. Once you evaluated them, um, if they were substantially the same in points, even if it was um, different types of work, um, then you made the adjustment. When they brought in the new methods in 90, um, effective in 93, proportional value was another method which was introduced. It's a bit complicated, but it basically means that you could put the jobs on what's called a, essentially a wage line and you could proportionately pay them what they should have been. So if there was an executive director who was male and there was, um, a, let's say, a, um, a receptionist, uh, and you did the points, you could figure out per, per point how much was it worth and therefore what proportionately should that person be paid. The proxy method, though, had to be used for the people who didn't have male job classes at all. And that, again, was a large section of people. And um, that then provided for comparing to a female job class that was similar in the public sector that had already got a pay equity adjustment. So somebody in a nursing home might compare to a similar job that got a job in a an adjustment in a hospital because there were many male job classes in the hospital. So that was the proxy method. And all of this at the time was considered quite... Um, uh, I don't want to say revolutionary, but it was really um, uh, making great steps in order to force employers to come up with an appropriate adjustment. And it applied to the private sector too, right? Not just the public sector. 
yes, that was the, I suppose, the other thing I should have mentioned in the beginning was that the act applied to the private sector and in some other jurisdictions, in, it didn't, it only applied to the public sector, but we've always had it applying to both. Now, Quebec also has a law which applies to the public and the private sector and the federal law applies to both. Right. So what's happened since then? Obviously, we don't have Liberal or NDP governments anymore. Um, we had we had some, you know, pretty conservative governments in between. Um, what would you say happened after that? And, and and wasn't there a sunset clause or something? And and did it actually sunset the Pay Equity Act? Uh, so it continues. Uh, and in fact, one of the things about the Pay Equity Act is it actually didn't have a limitation period. So people could still be suing in relation to um, adjustments that should have been made a long time ago. Um, the, I think what I would say about it is that from the time period, let's say from 95 onwards, we had conservative governments in Ontario. The conservative government came into power and immediately repealed the proxy method and took away the funding. And that was the other part of the um, fight of the coalition in the early 90s was particularly for the public sector that unless you had funding for those pay equity adjustments, a lot of those social service community agencies couldn't afford to pay the adjustments. And so it was an obligation of government if they were gonna implement this human right to actually provide the funding. So we spent a lot of time of trying to get the government to provide the funding and the NDP came up with a bunch of funding and they were in power by the early 90s. When the Tories came into power, they got rid of the funding, uh, a lot of the funding, and they also got rid of the proxy method. And that led us to do a charter challenge about the repeal of that method. And that charter challenge was successful in 97. And the law um, that was the proxy method came back into force. First, then they wouldn't bring back the money. <laughs> So there was a constant set of struggles. We brought another charter challenge in 2002 about the fact they weren't funding. We ended up as a right as all to that charter challenge settling for about $400 million that was paid out, but then the government stopped to gain funding. So it, it's, it's one of the things about pay equity because it actually costs money that nearly every government doesn't want to pay the money. And most employers don't want to pay the money. So there's a pretty constant uh, method, uh, uh, stream of attack against effective pay. Laurel, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, not on that specific question, no. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Laurel, are you familiar with the, I mean, one of the big, big struggles that went on around um, pay equity was the was with bell workers, right? Um, do you do you know anything about that? Um, no, I wouldn't. I would. I'd. I'd have to refresh my memory on that one. There, there were, um, there were quite a number of uh, uh, high-profile uh, cases uh, that involved uh, better pay and equal pay for women. Um, Bell Canada was, uh, uh, in some senses, the highest profile one, if only because it took so many, many, many long years uh, to uh, bring around any kind of uh, uh, resolution. Um, in, in the earlier years, there was actually one a similar fight with Air Canada, uh, but many of these fights got resolved uh, for good or for bad in, in quick order. The Bell Canada one uh, is infamous, uh, again, not only because of the, uh, the sheer number of uh, women involved, but uh, the, uh, the very, very many long years. And there were demonstrations on Parliament Hill, uh, as well as uh, in local communities. Can you think of other um, examples of, um, of organizations and employees having to demonstrate for equal pay? Uh, 
Well, um, there was one, some of these uh, relate uh, to uh, um, maybe more of the work of uh, the National Action Committee on the Status of Women and um, the Ontario Committee on the Status of Women in the earlier years. Um, there was a, uh, 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 there was a strike uh, that involved uh, building cleaners, modern building uh, corporation, uh, mostly Portuguese women. And uh, that became a bit of a lightning rod and uh, pulled uh, together a lot of people in support. Uh, that was uh, uh, a time when um, heavy cleaners as a job cl classification were always men and light uh, cleaners were always women. And uh, certainly their uh, pay uh, scales were, were very, very different. Um, a good example of the problem of job ghettoization. Uh, and, uh, uh, but it was complicated by the fact that uh, there was also uh, subcontracting, what we might call contract flipping now, uh, that was taking place, um, still takes place in that industry today. Uh, and which was also going to set the stage for eliminating uh, these women's union rights. They had had a hard fought uh, uh, collective agreement that gave them some protections, uh, which would go down the tube the minute uh, the contract was retendered to another provider. And in that industry, um, there were players in the industry who just literally flipped from one to the next every couple of years. And if Joe Blow Company didn't get it this year, they'd get it two years later. And this was the way they all kept um, uh, wages down uh, and unions out. Uh, this is, I guess, uh, again, an example of where there's a, a lot of interplay um, between uh, different, um, different forms of, uh, 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 exploitation that go on. Um, I think we see it today with COVID-19. I, you know, I think sometimes that we should be identifying the fight to try and extend uh, essential workers' pay uh, and make it uh, permanent uh, for long-term care workers, but equally uh, for people in childcare and grocery stores. So, and these are mostly women. Uh, and uh, so today, uh, if we were tackling this issue afresh, uh, we might characterize that as uh, yet another fight uh, to improve women's uh, pay in the labor market. You're mute. <clears throat> what role do you think race, class, ability and age played in contributing to wage inequality? Well, the, the data is pretty clear that all of those groups have much wider pay gaps um, than able-bodied white women. Uh, the, the, the pay gaps are markedly different. Um, and certainly the coalition, particularly in the um, uh, as we move forward, but also probably in the last 10 or 15 years, has, has focused a lot on that. And the other issue I think to, to think about was that back in the early 1990s, we actually had an Employment Equity Act in Ontario, which was also supposed to be trying to address, because compensation would have been part of what you could deal with in relation to an employment equity plan, was looking at the salary structures within a, a uh, workplace and addressing whether or not those salary structures were in fact racialized, um, whether or not, uh, or the, whether or not indigenous workers didn't even get into the workplace. Um, you know, so there's a variety of different ways in which it can get impacted, which leads to unemployment and a series of other things. And so the Employment Equity Act was quite an important step forward. And that was the thing that was immediately repealed by the Tory government in 19. 95, so the Employment Equity Act departed. Um, and 
And recently, people have been trying to use the human rights laws themselves to try and address various of these things. But we haven't yet um, had, I think, what would be a, a really important um, human rights case, which addressed the extent to which occupations are racialized and what, what that means for the de devaluation of their work. Because I think some of the same dynamics which, which led to the Pay Equity Act which were academic research that showed that the, de the greater the degree to which a job was associated with women, the more likely it was underpaid. It was the association with women that devalued it. And certainly I think that's also true with the association of jobs with racialized workers. Um, meant you could pay them less, you could give them worse working conditions and a variety of, 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 of things like that. Yeah. Was the um, Equal Pay Coalition involved in the Employment Equity Coalition? Uh, yes, we, well, we, we were supportive of, of, of it. And, um, and one of the other things was that a variety of the cases that were being brought, for example, the case that was brought with respect to the tar Charter Challenge around the elimination of proxy was brought by the Service Employees Union. And the long-term care homes, for example, actually have highly racialized um, workforces in them. And so the, the elimination of their um, you know, right to pay equity was a, was a serious problem and it had a serious impact on those workers. Right. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to ask you both to muse about in hindsight, would you have done things any differently or um, would you do, the, do it all over again? And, um, or what are the lessons, do you think, for, for present day, um, uh, present day young people? Okay, Laurel, you go first. <laughs> well, I would do it all over again. <laughs> uh, uh, Mary had the staying power to, I moved on to some other issues, but uh, in all of those opening years, um, uh, some of us spent every uh, non-paid working hour at uh, work with the Equal Pay Coalition, or Ontario Committee on the Status of Women, or NAC, and uh, e uh, equal pay for work of equal value, and all the related issues were, were quite central. and. Um, uh, I think most people who worked uh, on those various campaigns and efforts would similarly say that um, it was time and energy well spent. Um, of course, we made some mistakes. Um, mm -hmm. That is inevitable. But it, uh, I, I have to say that for myself, I, I don't see anything as a big regret. Um, and... Uh, uh, you know, I, I can see that there are some things that we might have kept on the front burner uh, more. Um, uh, again, things like um, minimum wage uh, could have been more a part of uh, what we were struggling uh, to secure and uh, pay equity and uh, uh, the particular form uh, that we ended up with in Ontario was a big win, but it was not the only uh, thing. And, um, you know, we're still struggling to, to get that legislation uh, elsewhere uh, in, in some form or other. So uh, the fight is far from over. Uh, I, I think that there are, uh, there are lessons, though, also about how we organized. Um, one of them was uh, reaching out as far and wide as we could and uh, not wearing uh, partisan hats. And I don't just political party partisan hats, but I mean labor union partisan hats and uh, uh, political uh, uh, organizational uh, hats, um, you know, it, it, to get anything done that's worthwhile, you really, really need to reach out. And if the organizations don't exist that allow you to do that, then you've got to create new ones, which is essentially what we did uh, when we set up the Equal Pay uh, Coalition. Right. Do you want to say more about that, Mary? Well, it's interesting because I remember at the time of the Pay Equity Act, um, we were criticized by 
some people out west who, for example, in BC, there was not a pay equity struggle in the same sense of getting a pay equity law. They did work around collective bargaining and, and important work. And so there was a sense there that we were spending too much time on trying to get these complicated legal rights with job evaluation and that it wasn't, uh, you know, this was kind of a technical thing and, it, and we should just, you know, use labor's power to get the money. And it used to be called, I think there was a book called, or article called, Just Give Us the Money, mm. right? And I mean, I always thought, sure, that would be good if you could just give us the money, but I never found anybody was giving us money. And, um, and I think I suppose if we, you know, had been able to mobilize millions of workers on the streets, maybe some, you know, capitalism might have given us more money, but that wasn't really how, what we were able to do. What we got was a legal right. Um, and the only way we actually were able to enforce the legal right was constant lobbying and struggle to even get the legal right enforced. And I actually recall at one point when the BC, uh, I can't remember what was happening, but somebody was going out of power and they wanted me to draft a pay equity law, like almost overnight that could be passed because now they thought maybe they should have a law. And, um, and then the law was immediately repealed by the liberal government who came into power. Um, so, uh, and there still is no uh, pay equity act law in BC to this day. And um, so in my experience, laws are important, legal approaches are important, the charter challenges were important, but it doesn't, but you don't get any of those things without the struggle of people to get them. And you don't get to keep them or try and prevent more of it being taken away without uh, a powerful struggle. And I think this goes back to the role of the union movement, which was also very important um, in the struggle for pay equity in Ontario and the role of the unions um, in actually financing the litigation that established the jurisprudence and they did this federally as well. So the Bell workers, I mean, they had, Bell was taking them back and forth to court. I can't even remember how many times that went back and forth to court. Um, and, you know, the unions um, paid for that to be done. And so it was very important that you had those structures. And I remember we used to say, Laurel, remember we you used to talk about that the quickest way when we were bar when we were lobbying, the quickest way to get a pay equity adjustment was actually to join a union. Because if you had a unionized wage, you were way better <laughs> than if you were a non-unionized worker. So that was kind of like your your pay equity down payment was getting a unionized job. And from there you actually would work to try and get actual pay equity but but it was a very important um role and um at the same time the community groups i recall the ywca would faithfully um uh, uh had uh mcgregor would come with me to meetings and it was always very important that we had those groups and the government was never able to actually divide us up right which i think they Otherwise, with some other issues, they would try to get people to say, oh, we don't believe that, you know, we think you only have to do this much. And the Equal Pay Coalition is trying to be too radical. We, we managed to get everybody into the tent um, in order that, and still come out with a pretty effective platform. Well, yeah, I would, I would want to add a, uh, uh, a note that it, uh, it was also primarily the feminists in the labor unions yes, uh, yes. that uh, drove a lot of this support, um, mm -hmm. uh, ranging from uh, Canadian public employees and postal workers and in Quebec, mm -hmm. uh, some of the unions there, and also organizations like the uh, former uh, Federation of Women Teachers Associations of Ontario, mm -hmm who, um, as a, a largely feminist uh, union, um, uh, helped mm -hmm. fund uh, a lot of the campaigning uh, work mm -hmm. and were upfront in supporting this. So I, I think the, 
uh, I give some credit to the unions. I come out of the unions and we fought hard for a lot of improvements in women's pay, but I give particular credit uh, mm -hmm. to the feminists mm -hmm. uh, in the labor movement. You mean that the, the um, business and professional women didn't cough up? Oh no, the business. Uh, oh, they were great. You know, we can have a conversation about that. No, that I, I, um, I didn't mean that actually. Mm -hmm. um, this is I, I wasn't be no. Uh, actually, the business and professional women's mm -hmm. clubs. And again, here um, uh, it took a particular, I would say, um, uh, understanding of class. Uh, and so you had people like Elsie Gregory McGill, mm -hmm. who was seen as, you know, uh, the, the ultimate leader of a club like this is Professional Women's Club, but she had an underlying sympathy uh, for working women uh, mm -hmm. and uh, lower paid working uh, women that went deep. And she's the one who got us into the business of professional mm -hmm. women clubs to talk to them and to explain the concept. A lot of those organizations at the beginning uh, thought that the employer's argument that this was just a semantic difference. We were playing word games by saying equal pay for work of equal value as opposed to simply talking about equal pay for equal work. Um, uh, they got us into a lot of places uh, to, uh, uh, to educate people and hopefully to find some new allies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Mary, um, the midwives issue is still outstanding, isn't it? It is, it is. Um, I don't know whether you want to say a bit about that. Sure. Well, we, th this was actually a new way we were trying to use the Human Rights Code. Uh, so the midwives who are actually paid as independent contractors by the government to provide midwifery services. Um, so we brought a complaint of pay discrimination against the government and we used um, the comparator of family physicians and positioning the midwife between the nurse practitioner who is female dominated and the CHC family physician associated with the male dominated medical profession so that complaint was brought in 2013, and in 2018, the Human Rights Tribunal ruled in our favor. And then subsequent to that, um, it took until 2019 to get an order, um, which gave them uh, back pay back to 2011. And we're currently, they've ordered the government to engage in a joint compensation study um, to discuss and evaluate the work moving from 2014 onwards. And in addition, the government though then appealed to the divisional court. Uh, the divisional court in June unanimously, a three judge panel rejected all of the government's grounds of appeal. And now the government's appealing again. Um, and uh, we got their motion for leave to appeal yesterday. At the same time, they're saying they're gonna implement it. But interestingly, that this has such uh, major implications that they would have a proactive responsibility to prevent and remedy systemic gender discrimination that um, they, they have to appeal. So, and, and basically the divisional court said, well, of course you have that responsibility, right? This is a responsibility you've had for many years. Any event, so it's, it's moving on, but it's hopefully it will also establish remedies for people who don't fall under the Pay Equity Act and who can move forward under the Human Rights Code. 